someone needs to click on got it. I got it. I clicked on it. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. it's me. <laughs> We're alive now. Yeah. So if there, uh, if uh, people coming into the room, the uh, um, uh, the moderators, can you accept admit them to the room? So we yeah, can. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Don't worry about the technology. Right? The technical term is okay. Thank you. Han, we can use the um, direct uh, chat to you if we have any questions, right? In other yes, words, of, we course, can... of course, you can use the direct chat. Right, okay. Do you think there might be quite a few people who are um, already on, but in the different venue where we can't see that there are people joining us? Uh, I think that we cannot see the people who are joining us. We can we can only know the the people who are also in this Zoom meeting like us. But the the people who maybe watch us or maybe because we are on the live, so I'm not sure about the number. <laughs> So shouldn't we just start because there might be people here already? Yes. So I think that maybe a, a, a two or three minutes later, we will start. Okay, uh, I think that uh, we should start right now. Yeah. So good morning, our presenter and participant, and welcome all of you to the virtual Vietasso International Convention 2021. On behalf of the organizing committee, we would like to thank you so much for your participation and contribution to our annual convention success. And we are Tunga and Dạ Nguyen, the presentation moderators today. 
We are very delighted to see all of you here, especially in this prevention workshop. And we hope it would be a good chance for all of you to gain some valuable knowledge as well as experience from this following session. And before the presentation, there are a few considerations. In case you have any questions or concerns about the presentation, please feel free to leave them in the comment session or the chat box so we can gather all the questions for easy response in the Q&A session. And please remember that the Q&A session lasts for five to 10 minutes. And we are very glad to welcome all of you in this workshop to the presentation, Exploring Translanguaging Practices in Primary and Secondary School in Vietnam. And about our presenters, we will have Mr. Tang Le, Ms. Dong Ping, Ms. Mary Wong, Ms. Nia Hu, and Ms. Hai Kyo Chen. And about the presenter, we have Ms. Uh, Mr. Le Van Kang. He is a senior lecturer at the East Vietnamese National University in Hanoi, and he has 40 years of working experience, and he has a lot of international and national publication. Unfortunately, he is busy on his schedule, so that's why today he cannot be with us on this presentation. Uh, the second presenter is um, Ms. Tung uh, Ping uh, Zhang, and uh, she is associate professor in the Department of Second Language Study at the University of Hawaii. and. Uh, she has a lot of st uh, study and her research um, based on uh, maybe the teaching and survey and try to integrate them all to bring the symbolic and natural and so social cultural ecologies. And the third presenter, let's welcome Miss Mary Wen. Uh, she is a three time Fulbright scholar and also an English language specialist to Vietnam. Uh, she has a lot of presentation and numerous publication. And she also got the PhD in international and intercultural education and the two MIS degree. And the next presenter, let's welcome Dr. Nya Vu. And she is an MI at Vietnam National University. And she got the PhD degree in education at the University of New South Wales, Australia in 2014. And at the moment, she is the Dean of the Faculty of English, the University of Languages and International Study, Vietnam National University. And she is interested in working on translanguaging research, material development and exploratory projects. And the last one, let's welcome Ms. Kiu Hai. Uh, she is a MA in linguistic at Vietnam National University, and she has nine years of working experience as a teacher in English language teaching. And her main interests are project-based learning and language transfer. And now I think that it's time for all of you to join the presentation. And I will like you to the moderator, Chen Kiu Hai, for this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nga, and good morning. Welcome all of you to the, uh, our con brief convention workshop on translanguaging in the Vietnam, uh, Vietnamese English classroom. And my name is Hạnh Nguyen from uh, the University of Languages and International Study, uh, Vietnam National University. And I will be with you as an MC for the event. <clears throat> Um, the workshop uh, Exploring Translanguaging Practices in Primary and Secondary Schools is based on a translanguaging project uh, started in August 2020 and co-funded by the Regional English Language Office, uh, the U.S. Embassy in Hanoi and the National Foreign Languages Project, the Ministry of Education and Training of Vietnam. And uh, we, the multiple, the multinational team of two English language specialists, Professor Mary here, uh, uh, <clears throat> Associate Professor Dong Ping, and three Vietnamese educators, uh, Associate Professor Le Van Kang, Dr. Vũ Thị Thanh Nha, and me, uh, worked on this project to hold two workshops, both virtually and face-to-face. -face for teachers from primary, lower and upper secondary schools to have them use translanguaging practice to better support students' learning of English in December 2020. And in March 2021, three big booklets were officially completed, which aims 
which aim to support sound pedagogical design and practices of trans languaging in primary and secondary schools in Vietnam. And this pre-convention workshop is the follow-up of the project. Um, okay, so in this project, um, the participant will expectedly achieve four objectives, which are uh, they will understand the principles of translanguaging, identify their stand, design, and shapes in translanguaging, and then followed by a session that helps participants to design a translanguaging activity in their lesson plans. Um, after all, participants will be aware of how to use action research to explore translanguaging. So before we begin, uh, please go through the agenda today. After the introduction that I'm conducting, uh, there's a short presentation on theoretical understanding of translanguaging by Associate Professor Dong Ping. Uh, the present, the Dong Ping will give more illustrations and examples about translanguaging in primary and secondary English classrooms. They also help us with lesson plans that integrate translanguaging. And in the next 40 minutes, Professor Mary will go through our, will go with us on action research on translanguaging. And after that, we have about 10 minutes for Q&A session. In the wrap up, our facilitators will have some special gifts for you to take home. Yeah. Okay, so uh, now I would like to invite a professor, associate uh, Professor Dong Ping to give the first presentation about translanguaging. Okay, so over to you, Dong Ping. Thank you. I just set up the alarm. So let me do the presentation. Yeah, I will do a screen share first. Share. Oh, now you can see my whole screen. Ooh. Okay. Present. You are sharing your desktop. I think that you should choose uh, like uh, your slide. Stop. My... Share again. Oh, okay. I should share my slide mm -hmm. now. Yeah, this one. How about now? Yes. Yeah. Look. Look great now. Yeah. Okay. Start from the beginning. Hi. As uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, this first section will be presented by me, but it's work mainly done by Dr. Lee Wang Khan who unfortunately who cannot join us today. Um, so in our theorizing of translanguaging, we uh, frame translanguaging as this big phenomenon, the elephant in the room um, is everywhere. We use L1 in our uh, English language classroom all the time, but uh, it's a phenomenon that may not be uh, picked up uh, very well in terms of teachers' confidence and perception and understanding of translanguaging and its ped pedagogical implication for classroom use. I wanted to add that translanguaging is not only an elephant in our classroom, it is all over, everywhere in this uh, globalized society. Uh, look at the sign of I love, oops, I should have you read how, how you read the sign and mask. Uh, presenting our uh, current pandemic coping. Um, so you can see we have language. Uh, we're familiar with I in English and Hanoi as English um, transliteration of Hanoi, how to, how to write it in Vietnamese, I'm not sure, but I'm looking forward to learning how to write it. And the sign of heart. So in this case, we say, I heart Hanoi or I love Hanoi. Does it matter? 
Okay, you think about it, uh, whether it is matter when we say, I love Hanoi or I heart Hanoi. From a translanguaging perspective, if we understand the context in which this is spoken um, in internet languages, nowadays people do say, I heart you, right? Because they read the translanguage that sign from a semiotic sign into love, the language of that form that we're familiar with. So this uh, multilingual phenomenon is very prevalent in our society. And I wanted to show you more, two more signs. These are from uh, Professor Li Wei's work. He and Dr. Garcia, two of the renowned scholars who introduced the phenomenon of translanguaging to uh, to apply linguistics and researchers such as Livan Khan and um, many of us, myself, have used it for rethinking about language as well as language pedagogy. So look at the sign on the left. In Chinese, the first sign means today and the second sign means, uh, a Japanese sign is a possessive marker and the third line is Shui uh, Guo, fruit. And then there's the English, and then there are semiotic uh, picture, right? So you can read today's fruit is watermelon. This is a shop that Dr. Li Wei visits very often when uh, he was visiting Taiwan. And um, he shared another sign when he came back, a student um, visit the same shop and sign him this new sign. You can now read today's possessive marker Japanese fruit, cut fruit, cut price. So you can see it's not a simple code switching. If you just say code switching, it would be switched, This possess the possessive marker is switched. Um, and you use uh, both the cut pineapple as a sign for cut. But this is not usually understood in code switching framework. This, if we expand this phenomenon to translanguaging, because translanguaging is both language and other semiotic resources. So you can see the patterns of fruit colors matched and cut is used twice, but for two different meanings. One is cut, mm, the pine, pineapple cuts, and the second one is the price is cut in Chinese is te jia. So I'd like you to think about these phenomena and these signs. Perhaps they are very um, um, much available in Hanoi or other parts of Vietnam or other parts of the world that you travel. It becomes a very uh, common phenomenon uh, for seeing signs that has a translanguaging context and also in our speech. So my uh, first questions, first set of questions for you is to look at the um, artwork or when you find a piece of artwork or picture from different cultures, how would you uh, make sense? How do you, oh, sorry, I have a typo here. How do you make sense of a piece of art? And simply another example, another question is when you hear an utterance, that you first uh, don't understand uh, or a word in the others that are new to you, uh, how do you make sense of it? Are you gonna look up the dictionary to say, oh, this is a possessive marker, a Japanese sign, um, or you utilize your all senses and resources available to you to try to make sense, right? We usually don't look up a dictionary or don't interrupt saying, what do you mean? Could you repeat again? In a normal, regular, pragmatic way of conversation, we usually don't ask such questions, um, but um, we utilize our resources available to try our best to make meaning, to continue to listen, try to find some clues, or try to find the uh, meaning from a person or speaker's ex uh, facial expressions or gestures or uh, gaze, right? These resources are all considered to be uh, semiotic resources. And when this is picture provided by Dr. Khan, I was like, 
oh, this one looks familiar. And for Vietnamese, you probably know what these uh, ladies are doing here, right? You make meaning from the practices of a holiday. For me, they're making zongzi, uh, a sweet rice wrapped uh, with bamboo. You can put different sweets, desserts, uh, I mean, um, dry fruits. Look at here, they may put different ingredients that's different from the zongzi that I am familiar with from my Chinese um, cultural background, which is the Dragon Boat Festival. We wrap up our rice with bamboo and to commemorate this poet, Qi Yuan, who commit, him, commit suicide. Right, so the different cultural backgrounds that brought to me when I was making meaning of this picture, I utilized my um, language, zongzi. I also utilized my personal experience of making zongzi to make meaning. So um, I hope this uh, gives you a general background of a, uh, how translanguaging becomes a phenomenon, phenomenon by pedagogy because in societal um, uh, circumstances, we see this all the time. And this is just bring a natural way of making meaning, making sense to, to our classroom. So translanguaging here is a phenomenon, three aspects. We are focusing on pedagogical action, but there are more than just pedagogical uh, action. I, I would like to just mention a little bit so that we all understand it's not just another pedagogical trend that we follow, right? So translanguaging uh, can, can give us a new way to look at uh, the definition of language in terms of uh, dynamic processes of uh, utilizing multiple languages and multiple semiotics for us to make meaning. So in this sense, language is reconceptualized as an action as an activity rather than just a form or form that conveys meaning. And it can be also used as an analytical perspective, helping us to understand a sign, for example, the fruit sign, right? If we just understand as code switching, we only see the text uh, meaning. But if we understand as a translanguaging social phenomenon, we understand Japan, uh, Taiwan, is uh, used to be uh, colonized by Japan. So Japanese culture and language has heavy influence in their culture. You can see the possessive marker in Japanese sign. So expand our uh, cognitive horizon for us to appreciate translanguaging in our society, as well as a, um, taking a serious stance and action towards our pedagogical practices in classroom. So, um, this is really sweet. We can see uh, translanguaging um, has been a puzzling phenomenon, maybe for many of us or uh, classroom practic practitioners. So it's not a simple switch between English or Vietnamese or other minority languages in, in Vietnam. Um, it's a phenomenon that overcome our biases towards named languages, right? Named languages are very handy uh, for us to use. Oh, you're speaking Vietnamese, I'm speaking English, you're speaking Chinese. But these are just named languages that are used for our convenience to refer something. But that something can be very fluid, can be dynamic, can be a sign, can be a picture, right? It doesn't have to be language per se. So in the rethinking of translanguaging, uh, we have been using Garcia Levy's definition, treating all these multiple modalities and language um, semiotics as a one linguistic repertoire for us to draw from, for us to make meaning, for us to learn. So we are no longer use, rely, uh, relying on mono, monolingual resources. We live in a multilingual society, so we should take advantage of it. So what does this mean for uh, rethinking, redefining uh, English language teaching. Um, uh, so as I mentioned, we are no longer rethinking as a monolingual speaker. We are a bilingual or multilingual speaker. So that means in our uh, English language uh, classroom or English language um, uh, pedagogical practices, we need to follow um, perhaps more on a dynamic framework uh, and the common uh, European 
framework of references for languages are, is very uh, in par or on par with the translanguaging framework. I won't say uh, too much in here because of my time limitations. I'm keeping an eye on my timer. Um, so, but the translanguaging pedagogy practices, what does it mean for teachers? What does it mean for classrooms? I have uh, summarized three key points for us to think through. And in the next session, uh, Ania will speak in the context of primary uh, elementary classroom. I will speak more on the secondary and then we can provide more examples. But three concepts to, 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 to be brought up here, very important when we think about translanguaging. One is to experiencing, right? So we are so used to teach and learn, but in languaging and translanguaging modality, uh, activity is at the fore, helping students to experience what things are like so that they have emotional um, uh, sensory input so that they have something to be grounded. Uh, so experiencing is a key concept for uh, taking the translanguaging pedagogy. I will explain more in my session further. Um, the next concept is called coordinating. Co <coughs> coordinating involves multiple people uh, doing something together to, to accomplish an event. So it's not just learning from the textbook, it's just not students learning from the teacher, but student teacher can be playing a major role in the event. And students at times can play a major role in the event. During these events, shaping up um, uh, opportunities, coordinating through language is key, helping students to use language. And in this sense, when L1 is necessary, use L1. When L2 is important, use L2. So there's really no um, definite answer what percentage of L1 should be used or what percentage of L2 should be used and when and how. So it's a dynamic process. In the activity example, I would, I hope uh, I will explain more how that can be played out for teachers and students have more freedom to liberate themselves to freely translanguage between L1 and L2 and some other uh, model resources. And the third key point, very important for maybe uh, upper middle school, upper uh, secondary school is this, is this uh, skill called inferencing. Li Wei already pointed out in his early work when he is um, introducing the concept of translanguaging. Because think about the example or the question I asked you. When you are facing a new sentence or new word in a conversation, what do you do? You try to inference as best you can from multimodal resources, from other modalities, right? And this involves all the work that involves trans, translanguaging, translation, transcending. So we're basically dealing with multiple domains and the multiple domains can be from I1 to L2, from an image to language, from translation of a uh, Japanese sent uh, Vietnamese sentence to English sentence, right? So all of these uh, trans practices involve not just language processing, not involves just teach uh, thinking per se, but it's a dual processing in, uh, in cognitive terms. We are involved deeply in our emotional engagement, in our feelings of what they say makes sense to you and in our logical thinking of what forms to use, right? So all of this are integral in the languaging and translanguaging process. So basically translanguaging pedagogy can be defined as a simple uh, process as the us students, teachers, as agentic users of more than two languages or more than two modalities or more than two semiotic resources by specifying or varying the uh, linguistic resources available or other resources available. So in a simple way to say it is when we are doing translanguaging, we should be freed up to make use of these resources available to us to help us as teachers to make meaning 
and help students to make meaning and how to help them to make meaning through inferencing or through coordinating or through experiencing. I will talk to you more about that in the uh, later sessions. So we take, if you understand or uh, buy in the stance of translanguaging stance, uh, we can help you or you can help yourself to design your activities um, through the translanguaging pedagogical principles. And then we can shift our paradigm from monolingual practices to multilingual practices that is more resemblance of our current globalized multilingual society. Okay, so questions to take away. Uh, do you think translanguaging means the use of L1 to L2? Have you had situations where you spoke two or three languages in the same sentence or in the same term? What is a good translanguaging practice and what is not a good translanguaging practice? I'm not trying to set up dichotomies, but questions for you to think through because we tend to say, am I doing the right? Am I doing the wrong? There is no definitive right or wrong answer, but I would like you to use your own judgment as a very resource for experienced teacher and very powerful students who comes in with their L1 linguistic repertoire or L2 linguistic resources to help each other to make meaning. Okay, so that's the first talk. I hope I'm on time. Yeah. I'll stop sharing. Um, so any questions? Insightful well, presentation of theoretical backgrounds and uses of translanguaging in the classroom. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Nya to give us a chance to look closer at translanguaging in the primary English classroom. Over to you, Ms. Nya. Um, thank you. Hi, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm a little bit of uh, like, uh, how to say, um, multiple tasks at the same time. So, so and um, as you, um, as you have uh, listened uh, from uh, Dong Ping's presentation, it say like just language is not about like uh, using the second language uh, uh, or using your first language. Uh, uh, it is like uh, increasing um, your resources, your student resources to make meaning. And uh, here I'm going to uh, give you an example of how you can do that uh, in the primary English classroom. And um, I plan to do um, quite uh, some uh, activities, uh, but I think I need to change a little bit because uh, some of you are watching it on live stream and some of you are in the Zoom. So uh, I would like, um, so um, when we talk about translanguaging in the classroom, um, it is um, like um, we, um, think about what kind of functions uh, that chance languaging can help us to, uh, as teachers to do things in the classroom. And um, here are the list um, that um, the Cambridge Guide for Chance Languaging already suggests. Um, so there are some core functions uh, like uh, when you teach at like uh, explaining grammar and vocabulary uh, because uh, sometimes um, um, if we use explanation and uh, some of the terms uh, for grammar or some kind of like uh, the meaning uh, is very complex uh, and um, there's a possibility that we can use um, um, our mother tongue, a chance um, we um, uh, switch uh, to our mother tongue to, to explain that. Um, and the second thing here is uh, like uh, when we can use uh, uh, chance languaging uh, to check the understanding of our student about the grammar, vocabulary, and the text. Uh, and um, 
The other um, thing that like uh, also happen in the classroom as well, we need to do some social functions uh, such as uh, um, managing personal relationship. Uh, we want to build um, the relationship or with the student or encourage the student to build the friendship with the friends uh, or sometimes it is uh, for many training discipline um, and uh, uh, for some situation we need to uh, give instructions uh, to do things in the classroom how to join the activities in the classroom uh, and the other thing here is uh, to deal uh, with administrative matters uh, and these kind of things uh, or sometimes the language um, that um, in the second language is uh, too difficult or inaccessible for the student. So we may think of um, uh, chance languaging in those situations. Uh, I'm planning to do the quiz in here, but I don't think that I, I have time uh, to, or you have the link to do the quiz. So I may want to uh, move um, it a little bit and into like uh, directly into a lesson plan. Uh, and this is um, a suggestion uh, from uh, the booklet. And when we work together and we think uh, that um, this is a lesson plan that adopts a task base. Uh, and um, um, they we, uh, we look at like a different stages of the lesson plan, like a pre-task. Okay, so the pre-task in here, uh, we can use um, the technique for chance languaging. It is a bilingual input. Uh, that means the teachers can um, um, provide uh, some um, inputs or make some relevant connection um, in both the English or Vietnamese. Uh, um, for example, like uh, when you, you talk, um, you talk about like a uh, hobby or shopping, you may have some kind of uh, like uh, the inputs uh, about uh, to relate uh, their um, habits or their uh, practices um, in the community. So in this situation, maybe the input can be um, done in both English and Vietnamese. Uh, uh, or the other thing here is, uh, like uh, when you introduce a student to reading or listening text uh, and we can elicit the student prior knowledge uh, about the topic uh, and we can do that in either English or Vietnamese or both. Uh, and um, the thing here, um, the possibility for chance languaging here is like uh, we, we need to activate, we need to elicit uh, the student's knowledge and understanding and their, um, how to say, their interest uh, in the topic. And uh, sometimes you know, the student cannot do this if they do not have enough um, language um, in the second language, um, like uh, the second language knowledge or skill, and they are not confident uh, to show their understanding or to show their interest. Uh, so it is a, a possibility um, possibility that the student can use their mother tongue in here um, and to make um, the lesson relevant to their experience and their knowledge. Um, and when we move to white task um, stage, uh, and in here, the students often uh, work together um, collaboratively uh, and they need to um, uh, achieve or complete a task uh, and in here, um, the student may discuss in pairs or in groups. Uh, and uh, of course, if the, the target language, uh, like uh, using um, the, um, for example, like uh, making a leaflet uh, in English, and the, the target language used uh, is still English, and the language in the leaflet is still English. Uh, um, but sometimes when they need to discuss uh, how they collaborate uh, together, and there's a possibility that they can um, chance language uh, in here. Um, and uh, for the post task um, and um, um, post task, the technique um, that is recommended here, they say sandwiching uh, summary, um, like uh, after the student complete uh, a task uh, or like an activity, and the teachers can invite the student to summarize a text uh, in either English or in Vietnamese. Uh, and um, 
uh, I observe uh, when I observe uh, like uh, university students, uh, some lecturers, they use uh, this technique um, quite often. Um, but um, we also think about like uh, uh, whether or not um, we, we, we use that very often for every post task, because uh, if we do that for every post task uh, activity, um, and then the student wouldn't have the habit of like uh, postpone their understanding and they wouldn't wait until the teachers or other people will summarize the content um, in, in the mother tongue and they, they don't want to try to use other strategies to understand um, the, the meaning during the lesson. So that's, um, there's a risk uh, in that. And the last um, part in here, and also um, the technique that is recommended um, for giving feedback, uh, like after the student finish the task and the teachers can give feedback and the the teachers can provide feedback on both student linguistic abilities in the additional language or in their emerging um, and their emerging language features. So uh, in the booklet, we recommend uh, some of the activities and the techniques for the teachers to use. So how about uh, what happened? Um, um, like uh, in here is uh, there's a possibility of using both Vietnamese or English. Uh, during the lesson um, and then uh, many teachers uh, um, come to me and ask uh, whether or not uh, uh, how to know uh, how to know that it is good to use Vietnamese or it is good to use English. Um, I think uh, there's no clear cut answer for this. Uh, um, but um, you, when you understand the principle of chance languaging and you understand the pedagogic uh, functions and then you know what you want to do in the lesson and then with your understanding or your assessment of the student's understanding, you will know uh, what to use, what language to use, and how to change language uh, uh, effectively. Um, and um, when we work in our team, we also discuss uh, about the misunderstanding, the possible misunderstanding about chance languaging and uh, um, what is a good chance languaging pedagogy and what it is not. So chance languaging pedagogy is about uh, um, communication. So when the student, um, we use chance languaging to help the student to understand and to communicate and to do things better. It is not just about like uh, switching from one language to another language, whether or not to use uh, too much Vietnamese or use too much English. So, and the, uh, the second thing that we also talk about like uh, the chance languaging pedagogy is like a lang a language teaching practice that allows language learners to use all their acquired linguistic knowledge, skill, and competence in their home language for meaning-making purposes. And it is not only um, the it is not about the the teaching method. Okay, so we cannot say okay the first step is this, the second step is this. But um, when you know about chance languaging and you know that it is a uh, a practice that um, is very flexible and that support the students uh, meaning making, understand uh, things and understand um, their friends and understand their teachers. Um, another thing about um, trans languaging pedagogy is uh, um, like, a, it is um, like a, a holistic view of language and other semiotic resources uh, and um, so it is not like a, a separate um, entities and of teaching languages uh, monolingually. So I mean, like uh, when the student uh, use, uh, it is not about using English effectively or using Vietnamese effectively, but it is about like uh, switching between the two languages and for effective uh, communication, yeah. And um, the other thing here, um, they also talk about like uh, um, it is a planned and structure and purposeful action and aim at developing the students' metalinguistic awareness 
multilingual competence and identity. It is not only about code switching. So sometimes um, I, when I work with teachers and there's a, um, one way that they talk about is, uh, um, wow, well, when the student don't understand, they switch into Vietnamese. No, it is not uh, about that uh, because uh, um, sometimes even like when you switch into Vietnamese or mother tongue, but it is not helping the student to understand because maybe the concept uh, or the, the, the way that they, 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 they need to use uh, other metalinguistic uh, features as well, like using action, using uh, the strategies to understand um, the message rather than like a, just a switch between the two languages. Uh, yeah, and here you can see like uh, the focus on communication, sorry. Uh, not um, about the focus on grammatical accuracy and the sentence uh, grammar. Um, so um, because uh, when we I talk uh, earlier, when I mentioned earlier, um, the teachers can use chance language to explain uh, some grammar points uh, or vocabulary, but the the end result that we aim at is to focus uh, on to help the student to communicate. It is not like to 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 ask them to remember uh, the um, only the grammar rules uh, or the complex uh, meaning of the words. Uh, okay, so this is a thing that we need to be aware of when we use chance languaging in the classroom. Um, and how about uh, like uh, for a lesson, uh, for a lesson for the primary students uh, in here, this is a sample that I got uh, from a teacher and it is for year four students. Uh, and the teacher teach like uh, what you like doing. And uh, there are some steps in here, yeah. And the objective is um, like uh, the student will use a structure and talk about what they like uh, doing. Um, and here are the procedures, okay. I may stop a little bit for you to look at the procedures uh, and um, to see um, when you can trans language um, or when uh, trans languaging is useful or effective. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so in here, it is uh, like uh, the teacher start with a warm up. So it is a song about I like. Yeah. So I think uh, for the warm up here, the teachers don't have to 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 use uh, a lot of complex uh, instructional language. So yeah, she use uh, the, um, English um, all the time. And when uh, she asks the student um, using the song and the some some cues and asks the student about um, like a, what's the topic? Yeah, what's the topic? And um, uh, in here, the, the, the student, sometimes they, they cannot use uh, um, the words um, in, in English to express the, uh, the things and they can move uh, and they can use Vietnamese in here. But at least uh, they, they are still communicating because uh, the teachers ask, uh, what is it about? And the student uh, may say like uh, the topic in their mother tongue. And um, um, the next step is um, the teachers ask the student to listen and repeat the dialogue. Yeah. So um, the dialogue in here, um, uh, yeah, listen and repeat the dialogue. And I think for year four student, it is uh, quite easy and it is just listening. And in this stage, uh, the teacher doesn't um, use uh, chance languaging. And um, here they learn vocabulary. Um, they learn vocabulary. Um, like um, they use some photos uh, and to talk about the vocabulary, like riding a bike uh, or uh, watching uh, TV and with some pictures. So it is uh, quite easy in this sense. And um, the teachers um, did not use um, 
uh, translate language in, in here. And uh, the meaning is supported by uh, pictures already. And when the teachers talk about like uh, a game, the hot seat, ask and answer. And here the game is very tricky um, because uh, um, in order to explain the rules of the games to the students, and especially for the primary students, and some students are uh, very new to the classroom procedures uh, and they uh, or the classroom routines, and they do not know what to do. Uh, and uh, if the games uh, are new to the student, I think uh, explaining the games using chance languaging to explain the how to play the games or the rules of the games uh, um, is necessary and it is a possible. Yeah. And, uh, and then the teachers uh, have uh, one section to discuss uh, the grammar rules, uh, like uh, making gerunds uh, from the verbs. Uh, I think uh, in here, um, um, the teachers, when I observe the teachers and I could see that the teachers uh, aim to, to, to explain the rules uh, and also in a very complex way. Uh, so that's why uh, her, the teacher herself has some um, problem of explaining the rules. Uh, and that's why she switched into Vietnamese. Uh, but I think uh, for this one, um, you can give some examples and show them the example and the student can still understand, yeah. And um, that is a, another game is about sunflower. Yeah. So what do you like doing and what's your hobby and the student learn and play. Um, if I have time and can show you the lesson plan and I can send you the lesson plan for this. Uh, um, yeah, I think uh, I won't I won't show you the, the lesson plan. I, I will switch and show you a lesson plan in here. Another lesson plan. Yep. So here's um, the lesson plan and uh, another lesson plan for, and the objective in here is of this is a for year one student and name some common body parts and they focus on like some words in here for year one student and on the left in here are the teachers activities on on the right uh, is a recommended uh, chance languaging uh, practices so. Yeah. Also similar to the previous one, yeah. And like uh, in here, the student um, review the new words and uh, to make a stronger connection between the home language and English, the teacher may use a um, bilingual technique that means like uh, to, to give the meaning of the words in, in both languages, uh, yeah. And um, Mm, here is uh, like uh, to introduce uh, the objective of the lesson. Uh, yeah, and the next uh, one is a presentation. So present the meaning of the words. Uh, okay, so meaning of the words because of the visual aids and of the flashcards. Uh, so language is not necessary. Um, but uh, when you say the words in English, uh, would help the student to get a familiar familiarize with the words and the, the pronunciation and the meaning in here. Uh, so if you use uh, like uh, the home language in here, maybe it's not a good thing uh, to provide sample for the student, uh, yeah. And here the student, um, um, next one is listen and find, it's a game and uh, point each item in the illustration. And um, this may involve the use of 
L1 to help the student to understand. Yep. And for here, listen and say, um, yeah. So the teachers can use gestures to, to, to explain. And um, if the student don't understand using L1 if necessary, yeah. And the next one here is um, like um, the, the task trace and number. So um, the suggestion uh, here is uh, we can use a trans language in explaining the task and giving feedback. Yeah. But in here, when the, the one or like I say the body parts, uh, because the, the target language is to say the words. Uh, so the student should um, use um, like um, um, the language, like a English in here, they cannot say the word in Vietnamese or in their home language. Yep. So this is um, a lesson plan. I may send this to you um, uh, later. Yeah, right. Uh, let me look at, um, sorry, let me share my screen again. Um, this is, um, so I think um, if you have uh, further questions or if you want to look at the, the sample plans or, or you look into how to apply into uh, um, a language lesson for primary students, uh, um, we can um, send it to you later. And there's a booklet uh, from um, the project uh, that we have uh, completed. And I think uh, the booklet is uh, being edited um, before it can be sent uh, to you uh, for free. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, to summarize, so trans languaging is a good teaching tool for the teachers. And uh, trans languaging is to support learners' understanding and trans languaging can be effectively done by planning, doing and reflecting on your own practice. Uh, and that's why when I say, why I give you a lesson plan. So I give you the lesson plan when you look at that and you can see the possibility of trans languaging rather than using that uh, with um, no purpose. Uh, and there's a possibility that uh, maybe you overuse uh, like uh, the home language and you do not provide the student with the opportunity to understand or to produce uh, the, ta um, the, um, the second language, the language that they want to build up, okay. Um, and uh, the last part of the workshop, um, I think that uh, will have some kind of reflection and follow up activity. So I, I come back with you later. And thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nha, for the very practical and interesting ways of looking at translanguaging in the classroom and with the, uh, the feeding of the lesson plan, uh, how we integrate uh, translanguaging into the activities. And now um, we will go back with a, a uh, associate Professor Dong Ping um, on translanguaging in the secondary English classroom. And Dong Ping, are you ready? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Nia, for a concrete example of uh, translanguaging. Connect uh, the first talk very well. So I hope the following presentation on secondary school, both I hope to get to, to both examples. So let's see, I need to put my alarm on. So I put on 25, 22 minutes. So that will tell me I need to wrap up soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's do the slides. Share.
Okay, so I can present here. You see my full screen? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, good. Okay. All right. So uh, just uh, recall, we have in the first part of the talk, we talk about the theoretical foundations and the stance of trans languaging. And the hope is we want to have teachers to understand the theoretical foundation and what does it do cognitively, emotionally for our teachers and students. Once that is uh, bought in or valued, it's much easier to think about or implement trans languaging in your own practices. So we said uh, experiencing, help children and yourself experiencing the world through translanguaging. Because if we only use L1, we tend to say, uh, I'm sorry, if we only use L2 or English or other languages, we tend to say, oh, they're not ready. They cannot do this because they don't have the skill. But if we integrate other resources, other modalities in L1, and they become a fully grown, alive person. We want our children to flourish, right? And in flourishing, they need to be paired up with each other, socializing so that they know who they are in their eyes of their friends. And uh, the more abstract skill is inferencing uh, through abstract symbols such as language and other concrete signs such as pictures and other uh, embodied uh, uh, gestures such, such as our embodied uh, facial expressions and gestures, right? So these are all different modes and uh, uh, semiosis that help us to make, to help us make translanguaging possible without big uh, uh, change of your regular daily classroom plans and activities. I think Nia did a really good job to show what a lesson plan looks like, and then I will further reinforce that. So, and then I will introduce translanguaging in Vietnam. Probably, I won't say much, but uh, mainly is to situate translanguaging in the uh, multilingual society of Vietnam, and also recognize that uh, translanguaging or um, L2, such as English or other languages may not be readily av available in uh, society, maybe through social media and through labeling of products, these uh, can be uh, readily available. Um, then I will talk about the lower secondary school in terms of uh, their cognitive, social, emotional transform transformation as teenagers, uh, they are going through dramatic change growing from a child up to an adult. So middle school is notoriously famous for cognitive development, very important stage uh, of uh, growing up for uh, grasping both cognitive languaging and social emotional uh, development. And I will introduce uh, uh, the uh, three ring conceptualization of giftedness and enrichment model using those already very well established models to infuse translanguaging in classrooms. And um, I hope we can get there. There's a lot to cover. So, but if you have uh, get hold of the, the booklet, these are all written in the book. Um, I will take uh, more in-depth view for upper secondary school because upper secondary school, they are really becoming adults and their uh, uh, inferencing skills need to be strengthened even further. For their, um, for their readiness for college uh, or uh, other types of education. Now I introduce another concept called Xu, which is very, very useful strategy or uh, um, uh, activity planning tool for implementing translanguaging. Okay, so I said this already, uh, translanguaging in Vietnam can be considered only available uh, is in the uh, online from online resources and in their textbook because I've never been to Vietnam. I'm really looking forward to an opportunity by seeing how uh, linguistic landscape 
multiling multilingual linguistic landscape is available in Vietnam. I assume it is, and uh, because it's such a modern world, uh, modern society, Hanoi is a hub for technological in innovation, right? Uh, so most worrisome children perhaps is from urban area. Uh, if you're a teacher from urban area, in the book chapter, I did mention uh, uh, about how to help urban teachers to, to be equipped with translanguaging pedagogy, okay? So then the, at the micro level of way, translanguaging also deals with all these grammar, speaking, and uh, vocabulary, right? And the skills beyond uh, listening, reading, speaking, writing skills, translanguaging also cultivates a skill for becoming a creative um, person. So in the chapter, I call it becoming a person, becoming, especially for lower uh, secondary school students. So this example, uh, I will use this example, unit 11 from the textbook, um, making our world greener, a greener world. Um, so, oh. oh, what happened? I jumped a little bit. Okay, here we go. So, uh, in the book, I brought in this uh, Ranzuli's work. He's very well known, a gifted educator and researcher. Uh, the model has been widely adapted throughout schools for gifted education. Even though at the time it's called gifted, I think it fits uh, for the 21st century education uh, literacy very well. So it involves uh, the three aspects of to talk about giftedness and to talk about creativity. To our surprise, we think our top students usually are creative or gifted. Ranzuli said no. Above average students are the perfect range of students to cultivate giftedness. And the creativity also is um, not just uh, creative in our imaginations, but more so in creative in integrating all different kinds of resources. Again, translanguaging makes sense, right? Integrating different resources, linguistic resources and semiotic modalities. And in order to cultivate giftedness, you have to have this laser uh, focus. Uh, students at the lower elementary school or uh, lower secondary school at growing from a child to an adult can be distracted in their body formation, in their uh, cognitive insecurity, right? So these activities should help them targeting their uh, focus and attention. Okay, and these can be actualized in a model called the enrichment triad model. So the triad model uh, goes very well with the textbooks activity already, and that is type two group training activities. So these type two won't be introduced very much so in the book chapter because the, uh, the school teachers and the textbook has done this part. What is not particularly addressed is type one and type three. Type one is general exploratory activities. This is what I call experiencing. We need to help children to see a sense of their, uh, the sense of the world through their eyes, through their bodies, through their relational friendship, right? And type three is more uh, of a higher order skill. Uh, it requires a individual or small group investigation on a real world problem. So this is what textbook knowledge or teacher uh, given tasks or even classroom activities cannot get them there. They have to go out to their community to experience what the world is like and come up with a problem and in groups solving the problem together. Through this problem solving process, they can use or engage in translanguaging. Therefore, translanguaging becomes much more meaningful than just doing code switching, right? They uh, use their own languages to solve problems for the world, okay? So, and going that, I'm going to take you to this um, activity uh, from, our, from our book, right? So in this book, uh, 
we use one, I use one example of unit 11, our greener world to show how transplant bridging can be infused into a very well uh, developed lesson plan already. So I would, uh, I added pre-unit and post-unit activities to enhance or to transform the already uh, well-made lesson plan. Uh, so the pre-unit would require students to go outside of the world. Okay, so um, the outside world meaning they need to experience what the nature is like, smell the flowers, touch the grass, and take pictures of the mosses that they observed, and come back with it, come back with readiness to tell a story to their family, to their friends. I saw this, this is really strange. I've never seen that before. Or my friend fell and uh, that really hurt him and we all feel sorry, but we are able to help him to feel better, right? All of this concrete embodied experiencing of the world is hard to achieve in a well-controlled classroom. So with these um, pre, unit exploratory activities, type one activities, and the well-planned grammar learning match up of a um, different verbal forms. They can have a app and flow of experience. They experience and come back, focus, do language forms, right? They experience with each other coordinating activities and they come back focusing on the textbook. So I call it a rhythmic pattern. In multimodal work is called app and flow and or uh, peak and valley. So they need both students, kids in their growing years. So, so do we as adults and needs these exploratory experiencing activities as well as textbook focused teacher for um, teacher centered um, teaching activities. So we're not excluding uh, explicitly of teaching grammar at all, okay? So the activity looks like this. I, I just follow the, um, the unit and make suggestions. The first thing they need to do is to shorten their teaching days more and from seven to four to five days so that they can have a day to do a field trip. They can go to a national park. If that is not possible, they should have children uh, do homework to observe their uh, neighborhood, uh, see what kind of things they notice that is interesting, that affects their environment, that affects the air pollution or the, uh, the, the cleanness of, uh, of the street. What is there they can observe that affects our becoming a green world together, right? So, and then follow that, they can come back to the class and look at the textbook, um, this is maybe too small. Let's see if I can make it a little bigger. Because the textbook has these, ooh, biggest is 200, What's that? right? Uh, this is right from the screenshot from the textbook, you can see. They can come back to use these vocabularies already in the textbook to match up, say, air pollution, um, can do what? Can cause flood, can cause breathing problems, can cause hearing problems, can make fish die or makes plants die. <laughs> so they can still follow up uh, the textbook. The goal is not to feel a sense of despair because when we talk about environmental problems, we tend to give up. We tend to say we're too late to save this world. But for them to see from their children, from their eye, they can see hope. They can take actions to help change the world, okay? So then the next activity, they can uh, look at three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle. And this, this is a perfect activity for coordinating, for supporting coordinating. So they can, uh, students in a group of three, they can act out one being a recycle person, one being a reuse person, and one uh, being a reduce person. So they can have a debate. They can uh, argue who is right, who should be the first. And through this process, again, they should be encouraged 
to use multiple languages available to them, multiple resources available to them. They should also bring a piece of material artifacts, a, a something that they found from their neighborhood, right? They, they took a trip they found from their neighborhood and take a picture of it and come back to share with each other. So that concreteness gave them emotional grounding. And next they can do is uh, follow the directions um, in the textbook and um, do multiple choice questions of the three R, three R club survey and follow communication prompts. And this one is interesting. They, uh, uh, I ask the students to imagine the three R club activities. Students can show their result by drawing a picture of their three art classrooms. So um, the, the activity asks them to decorate or um, to uh, find artifacts to bring to the class and to decorate the classroom. So they can, they can share what the newly uh, reduced, recycled and reused classroom looks like and label the classrooms with objects. So these concepts, become ingrained in their practice. It's not, they're not just learning about recycle, reuse, reduce. They're doing it. They're keeping it sustainable by practicing their own three R's. And by labeling the three R's, they are learning the language form. They are taking a language stance by saying recycle, R-E-C-L-E, -E, right? And they can pull it apart, pull up the word, and remake a new word, bicycle, recycle. Oh, good, bicycle, so that we can save more energy and we can recycle to save, uh, over, uh, save our world from overconsumption. So there are all kinds of creativity kids, students can come up themselves that sometimes is beyond our control. I call that free will, freedom. So teachers should not control all the time. You should leave some space for their creativity, okay? So follow the directions then. Um, and then after the group work for item six, uh, students can choose to collaborate to write a letter to the whole school and explain why it is necessary for everyone to take three R's seriously. So then by now they already, um, label the classroom, make their classroom three art, and use the objects they found in the neighborhood to show why this is important to start from us as a class. And they show the whole school to do it. So it becomes more of a pedagogical action rather than just practicing language forms. But through that action, the forms have meaning to them, have relation to them so that they are more likely to sustain it and to uh, use them in the future um, genres, for example, writing, for example, in different contexts in debate, right? So um, other activities that I suggested, including um, when they are taking a trip, noticing how beautiful the world. And this is where taking a language stance helps them. Because when we say there's a pollution, there's um, dirty water, we tend to be again in that despairing mood, but giving them tools, linguistic tools to find ways to describe the beautiful environment and give them uh, things to express about their feeling, what happened to the things so that they can uh, see the world from a, a greener eye, right? So, um, there are other things I suggested here uh, teachers can do, which is uh, uh, teachers can prompt students to note down a list of beautiful things, right? Not just them saying it, but encourage them to write things down, write things down so that um, the words not only floating in their head, but become a representation, become an object. So they are learning a vocabulary at the same time while doing these experiencing and coordinating activities. And um, let's see, what else is in here? When schools, day, 
they can do the report and what good things they found. I think this part is um, more interesting because I'm taking it into a deeper level to uh, taking the youth development in, uh, into consideration um, because again, this youth group is developing into a person. We can uh, encourage them to use these more um, uplifting words such as create, discover, compose, explore, invent, construct, design, research, and language, taking a language stance has an effect for their cognitive development and growth as a person, I stress it one, uh, again, again. And this is also one of the major theme on Ranzuli's um, uh, three ring of uh, conception of uh, giftedness education. Um, so teachers can also purposely use the vocabularies to model students to take compassionate action to help our world become a greener world, right? So these words can, um, um, such as care, mindfulness, compassion, sincerity, appropriateness, and authenticity, trustworthiness, all of this can help child to develop positive uh, upbringing in their uh, teenager years. Uh, these are the philosophies uh, in Confucian society uh, values. So um, uh, I understand that Confucian society, uh, Confucian values is a major part of a Vietnamese society. If I'm wrong, please correct me. But these values are rarely brought into the context of English language learning. And translanguaging provides a, um, a, a space, provide a ground to use Vietnamese to express these values. And more importantly, uh, ethnic minority group, groups, their values should be brought in through languaging as well. So I didn't get a chance to go to, uh, my time is, uh, I have four minutes left. Um, I didn't get a chance to go to the upper secondary school, but Similarly, upper secondary school can follow uh, the lower secondary school examples, except these kids are already forming their habit of languaging uh, or language behavior. They may be already very uh, comfortable to memorizing words when they get to this far. They may be very already uh, comfortable of translating, but making use of that opportunity. And from time to time, allow them also to explore themselves if they haven't done so in middle school. And in doing so, they can, um, uh, by doing so, they can um, explore how material artifacts have an effect on their language. So ask them to bring things, ask them to, uh, to share with each other why this piece of thing is so important as they are on the way to become a person. They're not just a language learner, right? They are also a person. They are making meanings. They are making sense of their surroundings. And these are activities I don't have time to explore, but I chose in the book, I chose this unit on understanding our body. So, and these are pretty um, abstract words such as circularity system, digestive systems. So I recommended that the students should bring, um, uh, take a picture of their breakfast and share with the class so that to experience the world and tell the story of their family and how their family um, take the health issues seriously. And interculturally, they can uh, compare uh, their, um, uh, medicine system, there's a, there's a screenshot in the book on a discussion of, of uh, acupuncture, right? They can talk about how their family uh, takes uh, different medicines to keep them healthy, keep their body healthy in comparison to other approaches. So in the nutshell, the more we can help our students to bring their culture to their classroom through their L1 use, which can 
enhance their discussion of things because of limitation of vocabulary. Then students can feel empowered as a person. They can talk about what their family is doing, what their beliefs are, how they become the way they are. And then we can help them to find different ways to, to integrate them together. And that Xu argument is a perfect example for it. Basically, Xu argument argues that our skills are all interconnected. We can do reading immediately after writing, or we can do speaking immediately after listening. Once these skills are connected, we can have our cognitive linguistic or semiotic resources ready to engage in other skills. And this um, has been approved in multiple uh, research publications, very effective for language learning. Okay, uh, my time is up and uh, these are all written up in the booklet. And these are uh, the, the talk just gave you some more uh, uh, background information to help you to appreciate our approach and our work. All right, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dongping, for your very detailed and practical guides and suggestions for teachers how to integrate um, the uh, translanguaging into their lesson plan. Um, and uh, uh, as you know, translanguaging is a practice that you will develop via a process of continuous, continuous practice and reflection in, with your student, with your own students. And uh, uh, teachers are recommended to, uh, uh, to, to um, conduct the action research on translanguaging. And now, uh, Professor Mary will give you a presentation on action research in uh, translanguaging. Um, Mary, uh, over to you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, I just want to start off by just saying thank you to just the conference committee. Um, they were just so supportive in just giving us moderators and sending me so many reminders and just setting up this conference in such a professional manner. So just my kudos and my thanks to the conference committee. Um, I'd also just like to thank my colleagues. I've just, I've learned so much from just what I've heard. I mean, I wrote this book with these guys. I should, I should know it, but just to hear the passion come out in their in their voice and and just their love for their students and how uh, what we can do to make just our English language uh, teaching more meaningful to our students. And we've kind of stumbled on this translanguaging as a way to do that. It's really been fun to kind of explore this together. And um, thank you for the participants. I, I saw there's quite a few people here and uh, really appreciate the time uh, that you are putting into this. And I hope that you find um, this final presentation somewhat helpful as well. We are gonna have some time for, for questions coming up soon. So start thinking about questions you have for the other speakers or myself or anything. Maybe you wanna ask other um, you know, teachers who are here as well. So we look forward to that. Okay, so just let me get started. Um, all right, why can't I advance this? There we go. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, translanguaging, but um, we've done so much of that. So I probably don't need to do uh, a lot on translanguaging because we've heard so much already, but I thought if some people came in late, maybe I better do a just a quick review. And, <clears throat> you know, just to remember that there's so many benefits of um, using not just English in the English language classroom, but all the languages that the students bring with them, not only the languages, but all the things you see in the classroom and that are from outside of the classroom, right? Um, everything that we have to help support our learning. To me, that's what translanguaging is about. It's, if you see the second bullet, it's, it's acknowledging and drawing from the full language repertoire that students bring to the classroom to improve learning. And also in a way to support social justice goals that value students' identity. You know, sometimes we used to say English only, 
and it would make students somewhat even ashamed of their first language perhaps, but when we value the, their languages that they bring and the cultures that they bring, it, it does create this social justice component that I always like to um, think about. You know, it's like going to an art class. I don't know, art was one of my favorite classes. And, and the teacher saying, pencils only. We're not going to use anything in this art class but pencils. There'll be no markers and no painting and no paper mache. That would be awful, wouldn't it? So to me, monolingual restrictions are like giving your students only a pencil in an art class instead of all these other resources that are available to them. So, all right. And I just thought I would talk quickly about the head, the heart, and the hand. And trying to raise both teachers and students awareness to how they use L1 and L2 in the classroom. How are they using the student's first language to support learning? Um, uh, just, just becoming more aware of it and how students are using it, right? Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. What I mean by the head, the heart, the hand, um, we might think of it like this. The head is more the theoretical lens and Dong Ping gave us such a good orientation to that. Um, you know, how are we thinking about our practicing? How are we thinking about translanguaging as a, as a, as a, as a verb, you know, as a, something, an action that we're doing? And the heart maybe, what is our stance towards it? How can we value our students and the languages and the cultures that they bring? And then the hand is, you know, the pedagogical approaches, which we're focusing on today. And then I'm going to talk, of course, about action research, because my session today is, is um, kind of looking at, you know, translanguaging can be so many different things, and you need to explore what it can be in your own classrooms. We tried to give you some examples in the booklets that we've created, but you really need to take this on yourself, and you need to think about, how, for my students and for me in this school at this time, how can I grab a hold of these translanguaging practices and ideas and, and make learning more meaningful in my classroom? And action research can help you do that. So action research is simply the process of systematically collecting and analyzing data, typically in multiple cycles, to respond to a particular question. So yeah, you have a research question and you're gonna collect data and you're gonna analyze that data to help you answer that question, all right? So, hmm, and it puts teachers at the center of the inquiry. Teachers are an active agent in the process of discovering and applying new ways of teaching and learning to better meet the needs of their students. It's not researchers coming in in white coats and kind of researching you or your classroom. It's the teachers who are doing this work, yeah. Um, and action research is, it's just an ideal tool because it can empower teachers to move beyond just being teaching machines, which I saw in a Vietnamese uh, publication, but to use adaptive expertise, which this Vietnamese publication said they wanted to do, to move teachers just from teaching machines to adaptive expertise, to transform learning. That's what this is all about. So in this session, um, I'm going to outline ways that you can explore how you might avoid maybe too little, too much, or unexamined, the most important thing is the unexamined use of the L1 in the L2 classroom, and how you can leverage the use of students' entire language repertoires and all the modalities, right, to support students' language learning and identity formation. And then finally, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about researching translanguaging. I'm gonna use translanguaging as the example of action research, and I'll take you through an example, but I better get moving on or I won't have time. But basically there's been a lot of research on translanguaging and on action research, but maybe not the two together. So I'm hoping that some of you might be the ones who would do some of this research, action research on translanguaging and maybe fill this gap, all right? This gap in the literature that we find. So to find out how translanguaging can improve your students' language learning, we need to consider these things. What, what it is and, and do I embrace it or do I just tolerate it or do I resist it, right? Um, and we're hoping that you will embrace it. And then in terms of the heart, what is your stance on the um, ideology of English language teaching, of native speaker models and of plural lingualism? Um, translanguaging kind of, uh, kind of gets at all of that. 
And then finally, how can you apply it in your classroom? We've given you some examples already. Um, and then how can you assess it, right? So I'll go really fast through this part because we've been talking about this so far a lot, but translanguaging. These two books I have here are by Suresh Kanagaraja. Um, I really, he's a, he's a fun friend of mine. I did a book with him, but he has, I, I love his quote that I'm going to give you here. Let's, the second one, he says, um, he says that communication really is shuttling between languages and it's negotiation of meaning. It's a negotiation of diverse linguistic resources for situated construction of meaning. So we're constructing meaning and we're doing this not by just using one language, but our, our full repertoire of languages and all the other things we see around us, right? But he also reminds us that translingual, translingual practices, they're really not new. And they take place all the time in translingual communities. It's the teacher's task to understand, affirm, and develop these resources and support our students in them. Yeah. Um, these are some other well known books on translanguaging. I have photos there. Vogel and Garcia note that translanguaging it privileges bilingual performances and not just monolingual ones as pedagogy, and it leverages the fluid languaging of learners in ways that deepen their engagement and comprehension of texts. I'm going to have to move on a little bit faster here to get to the action research part, but I don't think we have to assume that teachers have to teach students how to do translanguaging because they're doing it already. We just have to tap into that and explore how we can scaffold that right and further develop it. All right. Um, and I just thought I'd talk about two different kinds of translanguaging pedagogy. One we call spontaneous, and it sometimes takes place without even planning. Um, it occurs when teachers foster ongoing dynamic interaction in multiple language to support learning. But what we're talking about here is a more planned translanguaging, which requires some, some um, systematic planning and requires knowledge of the student's multilingual linguistic resources and, and drawing out the similarities and differences between maybe uh, the languages that they use and speak. Um, just some more examples. Uh, Vogel, who you see here, she says, our students have the gift of bilingualism and their lives are enriched when they're able to use all their languages. I like this when she says critically, refle reflectively, intentionally, and creatively. Right, and that's called translanguaging. I'd like to go back and unpack each of those words to do it critically, you know, um, reflectively, intentionally, creatively. I just love that definition of translanguaging. Um, examples of a translanguaging approach is when we ask our students, and they like to refer to them not as English language learners or but English language students, but emergent bilinguals, right, to write a journal or to use English for structure they have been taught, but maybe home languages to express new and complex ideas, even if the teacher might not know those languages. <clears throat> in Vietnam, of course, you know Vietnamese, but there might be some students in your classrooms who speak other home languages that you don't know. They can still use those languages even if you don't know them in some um, pedagogies, which is exciting to think about how that could happen, right? Um, but it just, all languages and things that students bring to the classroom, they're all seen as a valuable resources that teachers can um, uh, tap into. Um, I'll give you just a couple of really quick examples. Um, in, in the first example, they had, they had students kind of uh, do a drawing. You can see this drawing over here. And they asked them to label Spanish as red and English as blue. And notice that the students say, I speak in both Spanish and English. And I see things in both my both cultures. I hear things in both cultures. And their hands are also red and blue because they write in both, cult both languages too. Um, so this approach, it uses culturally relevant materials such as maybe a graphic novel, like, um, you know, with, with a character, maybe from their culture, maybe from China could be the Monkey King, right? And students are then asked to make their own graphic novels using English for what they can, and maybe their home languages for more complex content. Here's um, a picture of that, where maybe you would look at a graphic novel in another, um, from another culture, another language, and then give that as an example and ask them to do that, right? Okay, so you know about translanguaging. You've been here th through our session. Let me move on to action research. 
So let's look more carefully at this. So yes, I told you it had to be systematic. When we ask some Vietnamese teachers about action research, they go, oh yeah, we do that. We talk about what we do in classroom and then we change what we do. And isn't that action research? And I would say some people would define that as action research, but I think it's a little bit more intentional and systematic where you actually have to have data, data. You have to have data, right? You collect data and then you have to analyze the data. And usually it has to end with where you're actually presenting the insights um, to another group of people, hopefully to teachers who can then learn from that and keep that going. It involves planning, acting, observing, and reflecting, okay, carefully and more systematically and more rigorously than one usually does in everyday life. Um, and it's research done by teachers for teachers, right? And it bridges the gap between theory and practice. And it assumes um, and improves teaching practices and learning. Okay, assesses and improves it. Okay, so if you look at this graphic, you'll see that it has three different cycles, right? Um, so we have a cycle where you might um, make a plan and then you do something in your class, you take an action and then you collect data and you reflect upon that data and you say, hmm, I think if I change it just a little bit, it might get even better. So you make another plan, you take an action, you collect data, you reflect. So you can see that it's often cyclical with multiple cycles, not always, but most of the time when we speak about action research, we're talking about these different cycles that it just keeps on going, right? So, um, you know, again, what is it and why do we do it? And there I have a graphic of the cycle where we plan, we act, we collect, we reflect. Um, and an inquiry is just speculating on why something is the way it is and works the way it does. You know, my husband was a researcher in a hospital on eye cancer and he got paid to ponder. He got paid to, I wonder why this is happening. And I think teachers too should be paid to ponder. We should be, we should consider it part of our duties to wonder why did this work with this student, but not with that student? And what can I do to find out why, right? So it's, it's speculating about this and it's trying to find out why. It's a question. We, it's, it's specifying the inquiry in a form of a question that can then be researched and you can you know, investigate it and it's action. That's why we call it action research. You have to do something. You have to do something and see the impact. It might make learning worse, but hopefully it makes it better. And then you can um, continue to improve it. And then it, of course, it includes data collection where you gather information in a disciplined and systematic way that can address the research question, but we're not done yet because you also have to present that and you have to share it. So going on there, we're planning, acting, collecting, reflecting, maybe in multiple cycles. Um, we have to analyze the data. And when we say analyze the data, think of it as like taking the data apart to see what's there, maybe putting it back together to see how it responds to the question under investigation. And then hopefully that leads to new insights and understandings, right? New or existing information, interpretations, insights, perspectives on the questions. And it accumulates um, through the research process. And then we keep repeating this, the process, the different cycles until we're satisfied. We feel like I've gotten some answers to my questions, right? And then here it is, the publication. You must enter into the public conversation beyond the research setting to voice your understanding, either through discussion, presentation, or advocacy. So we want to, we want to um, say that action research must move beyond just the research. You're not just doing research and say, okay, I did it, but you have to come to a conference such as this one, right? And share what you found and get, and answer questions and see what other people are thinking and doing on the topic. All right. So <clears throat> I wanna move into, well, maybe you wanna do action research. Let's think about planning your research. What would you do? You'd have to ask, hmm, what is my inquiry? Why am I doing this? Where will it take place? Who would, take, who would participate? How am I gonna collect the data? When am I gonna collect the data? And who benefits from these? from my study. Hopefully you will, and hopefully your students will. 
But these are some questions to think about as you plan it. You know, there's many types of research and learning communities and types of action research. You can do action research for professional development, just to, I wanna improve myself as a teacher. You can do exploratory action research where no one's really looked at this at all. And it's a brand new area that you just want to explore. You can do collaborative action research where you're working with maybe all the teachers who are teaching a certain class at your school or the whole school is working together on, on an action research project. Or maybe you're collaborating with an international researcher like myself on, on a topic of how to use translanguaging in the Vietnamese classroom. <clears throat> Participatory action research usually involved a social justice component where you're trying to look at maybe marginalized groups and how you can make um, you know, the, the school or the classroom more inclusive, uh, more socially just. There's also <clears throat> classroom-based action research where you limit it to just the classroom. You're only looking at the classroom. Participatory action research, the one before it, often goes into the community and beyond the school and the classroom. So that's why classroom-based action research is just defined by the parameters of just the classroom. Okay, and then you have school-wide action research, as I mentioned before, an entire school can take on a project, um, if you will. All of these types of action research are described in more detail in our little booklet that we hope will become available to you very soon. You know, when you talk about research, you often have to think, what is the difference between data, data collection and data analysis? Sometimes, Sometimes it all gets lumped together. And if we understand this a little bit more clearly, it's easy to understand like data are not the answers to your question. It's just the raw data. It's like the students' opinions or the teacher's answers to the survey, right? It's the raw material out of which response to your questions will emerge. It's the organized, sustained and well-managed process of gathering the data that is data collection and then the process of drawing responses out of your data is the data analysis. So you can see that research is a little bit more involved um, and includes all of these things. So we have to think, hmm, what are some data sources, particularly about translanguaging and about maybe improving my teaching using translanguaging approach, or um, it could be your students' opinions. It could be your students' perceptions. It could be the students' languages they use both in and out of the classroom. It could be the progress they make in their language development, um, the teacher's opinions and perceptions, or teacher's pedagogical practices and language in the classroom. So this, these are all you know, sources of data. So if you're gonna collect that data, you have to think, well, how can I get that? How can I write it down? How can I um, get at these data sources? Um, all right, so <clears throat> there's some challenges to data collection. Oh, it can go on for out. <laughs> it can go on and on and on and on. So you have to keep in mind what you're doing and why you're doing it and keep a tight focus. Wait, I could collect a lot of data, you know, but you want to get just enough data that answers your question. You have to stick to your plan, stick to your inquiry, and you want to make changes very reasonably and systematically. If you make a change, you have to write down why you're doing it. You want to adjust your research question if necessary. Sometimes you have to tweak the question. One of the biggest tips I can give you in terms of research is this. Less data well collected is more valuable than more data poorly collected. You don't want to have a huge amount of data that you've never analyzed, what are you going to do with that? So you have to really think carefully about the type of data you're going to collect and analyze. It can get overwhelming. So let's look about action research on translanguaging. I tried to tell you a little bit about translanguaging, a little bit about action research. Now we're going to look at how can you do action research on translanguaging? So get into this. How are we doing on type? Yeah. All right. So I'm going to give you a quick example. The research question is, what happens when teachers support student learning with translanguaging approaches? A very broad question, right? So I'm gonna give you an example. So um, let's look at maybe lower secondary level, right? Um, and since translanguaging approaches, they seek to use culturally relevant materials, right? You might look, as I mentioned before, that graphic novel from a, from a Vietnamese culture, right? 
I noticed that the current curriculum for lower middle schools has our heritage as a theme for grades six through nine. So this activity could fit well within that particular theme, right? In this example of a, part, a potential collaborative action research study, it could be collaborative in that you have researchers and teachers in a small in working together, or just to make it simpler, you could just have a small group of teachers. Maybe some of the teachers in this session today could work together, right? And they could meet together and engage in active listening to one another. They could have a time, uh, you know, to have time to build trust and to share ideas, and maybe together come up with a research question, right? Then they could look over the curriculum and they could co-plan a way to apply translanguaging more intentionally in their languages, um, lessons, I'm sorry. And in this case, maybe using graphic novels because that's the example I'm gonna give you. So since I talked about cycles, let's say each cycle is three weeks. So we're gonna have three different cycles. In cycle one, you could co-plan right? And the team could decide to have students just read a graphic novel related to Vietnamese culture and then begin to create their own graphic novels in English that portrays a, a hero or a heroine, right? So that's the plan. And the action would be that students in each of the teacher's classrooms, right? They read a sample graphic novel and they begin to draft their own. Now you want to co-collect data. So at the end of the cycle, you want to collect data and you want to co you want to analyze it with the other teachers. What could you collect? You could use the teacher's logs. You could use student journals, ask the students to write about what they did that day. You could actually use the graphic novel drafts, right? And then the maybe the three teachers in the group could look at it together and have a co-reflection and co-analysis. They would analyze, and the analyst might the analysis might reveal the graphic novels are maybe a bit too simplistic, and students were not engaged enough. Just want to make sure I'm I'm looking at my time. Okay, so that was cycle one. Um, the teachers got together. They had a plan. They did it. They collected data. They analyzed the data together. Now let's look at cycle two. So we have weeks four to six. So they're co-planning again. And maybe in this cycle, the team decides that students need to be encouraged to maybe go online. You know, it's multimodal, right? You want them to go online, to read more graphic novels. They could read graphic novels in English, but also in Vietnamese or other languages they know. And they could come back and they could discuss with each other uh, what they found in small groups, right? And maybe they could add more complex concepts to the graphic novels, which maybe you found in the first draft rather simplistic. Maybe they could annotate their graphic novels in Vietnamese, although it's written in English, they could add some Vietnamese um, fun little things in there, right? Um, so the action would be the teacher has students go online to find examples to discuss their projects in L1 in small groups and to annotate their novels in, in their first languages, right? Then you would collect the data during this cycle. So what would you collect? Well, Maybe you could do some observations and you would observe the process of what the students were doing in the small groups and you could take, you could take notes, right? At the end of the cycle, um, following this, you would want to analyze it. So maybe you get together with your teacher group and you'd look at the teacher log entries and the student journal entries. You would look at the observation field notes and the graphic novel drafts, right? So let's imagine what the outcome could be. So you're looking at these graphic novels and you might say, oh good, it does look more complex. They are more interesting. Finding the examples online and talking about them in other languages and annotate the, annotating them in, in more than one language seem to make them more interesting. But you're starting to notice that some of the students perhaps are resisting what you're doing. They don't like it. And so you say, hmm, let's try to find out why in this next, in this next cycle. So in this last cycle, you think, hmm, the teacher maybe wants to ask the students to journal about and discuss as a class what it means to be bilingual and the possible benefits of translanguaging. So the teacher provides maybe some modeling and scaffolding for annotations, right? And then you would collect, maybe you'd collect the graphic novels again, the teacher log entries again, the student journal entry, and then you would do an analysis of that, right? And 
hopefully you might find students who are a bit more confident about um, using their L1 and L2 and about and developing and not being so preoccupied as English or as Vietnamese or what they're doing, but just learning is just um, more complex and more exciting. That's what I would hope would be found. So maybe your new insights would be that most students embrace the ability to freely move between languages and use multi-modalities in the classroom. Specific examples are uh, that are modeled and scaffold, that when teachers model and scaffold, that, that kind of demystifies the process and helps them. Another finding might be um, that, uh, oh, and then you want, you want to make sure that you write up your findings and you share your findings maybe at a conference like this, or even in an article or somewhere. So um, I just wanted to talk quickly about possible resistance to action research, because sometimes um, mm, teachers don't wanna do action research. And there's, there's lots of reasons why, right? We're gonna look at these reasons. I want you to think about these and maybe think about other reasons you might have, and then, what it might take for you to get over these. So you might say, wait a minute, you expect me to do research? How can I do research? You might say, I don't have any time. That's not in my job description. I am so busy right now. I have so much teaching, so much grading. There's no way I can do it. I just don't have time. And that's, that's a legitimate, that's a legitimate problem. You might also say, you know, I don't have the knowledge or the skills to do research. I'm a teacher, I'm not a researcher. Isn't that for professionals in white coats and not me? I don't know how. I don't, I don't know anything about statistics. I just don't think I could do that. Or you might say, I don't have any support. I can't do this without support of my administration or my, my peers. My teachers, my colleagues might say, what are you doing that for? You're making us look bad. Don't do so much work, <laughs> right? So these could be all reasons to kind of stop us from doing action research so I just wanted to acknowledge this and you might have others. And if you do, let me know what those are. Um, but I think if we think about the benefits of action research, it might help us maybe think that, well, yeah, there's some challenges, but the benefits might outweigh the challenges. So what are the benefits? We're going to look at these benefits. Let me know if you think they're um, true for you or not. And then maybe if you can think of other benefits and then do the benefits possibly outweigh the disadvantages. So here are the benefits that I can think of. It can help you solve a specific pedagogical problem. Like why are the boys in the back never participating? You know, and you can do some action research to, to try to pull them all in. Maybe action research on translanguaging to pull them all in, right? Um, also, another benefit, it can help you grow professionally, right? You want to continue to grow professionally or uh, you can get burnt out as a teacher and that's not fun. Um, it can also help you improve your own teaching to better meet your students' needs. And that's really important. Um, obviously, we always want to meet our students' needs. So we wanna make sure that we're doing that. Um, just keep my eyes on the time. And then also, um, Action research has worked before in Vietnam. You know, our colleague, uh, Dr. Khan, he's not here today, but he's written a, a really interesting article um, and it had positive results with 33 teachers um, with just eight days of training who used action research in Vietnam. So the benefits are, it can help you solve problems. It can help you grow professionally. It can improve your teaching and it can improve, you know, improve your students' learning. And it's, it's worked before, right? So another reflection task in the book, and I thought I wanted to ask us is, hmm, so what are the solutions to these um, problems? And how can we make research more feasible? And what else would be needed to make it work? So, hmm, how can we make action research more feasible? I would say you have to be committed to make time for it. Maybe you could tweak what you already do in the classroom as a teacher, and that can be the data you use. For example, you're going to grade your quizzes anyway. Can those quizzes somehow be related to your action research question, right? Or um, something else that you have them do. They have to do a project anyway in the classroom. Can that be related? So what you want to do is you want to overlap your research and your teaching. 
So the things that the, um, the data that you're collecting is actually some of the projects that students uh, could do in your classroom. That's a, that's a real tip. And you also can acquire the knowledge and the skills, right? You can view yourself as I'm not just a teacher, but I'm a teacher researcher. I want to I want to improve. I want to ask why does this work and why doesn't this work, right? You can create knowledge. You're not just you don't just get the theories and apply the theories. No, you're theorizing your practice, right? Um, and you can come to workshops like this to, or just go online and read more about action research or join a club and read a book together about action research and engage in it, right? Um, and also you can find support. You can maybe work with your peers, say, let's do a presentation next time on, on our action research project, right? Or you can join a teacher learning community and, um, or maybe ask to get release time can I teach one less class or do one less um, teaching duty so that you can engage in this research? Um, so ask your administration, you never know. Okay. Um, I wanna keep my eyes on the time, possible research questions. So there's so many questions that you could ask and you really need to think of your own questions, but these were just ideas to get you started. Um, you could ask how, when, and why do I use Vietnamese in my English language classrooms and how do my students feel about that? Um, how can my use of languages in the classroom be more strategic? And by strategic, I mean be more critical, intentional, reflective, and creative. And how can it better support student learning? Or maybe how can I learn more about my students' home languages and use and find ways to better support the formation of their linguistic and cultural identities, right? Or maybe number four, how when and why do my students use L1 in the L2 classroom? And how do how do how do different stakeholders feel about that? How do how do I feel about that? How do the students feel about it? How do their parents or administrators feel about that, the use of the languages? And then how can I encourage my students to reflect upon their language use in the classroom? And how does this impact their learning and their sense of identity? These are just sample questions. I would hope that you would ask your own questions. Um, and if we had more time, I'd have you write out your questions and discuss them. It's really hard to write a good research question. When I teach my action research classes, I've been teaching for 20 years and the, oh, their questions change. I say you change your research question more than you change your underwear. <laughs> you just it just gets tweaked and tweaked and tweaked. Um, uh, so it's okay, but you want to stay within the same area of inquiry, right? Um, but it's really fun the whole research process. Um, okay, I'm going to move on to data collection techniques. I've already mentioned some of these, but I thought I would just be a little bit more um, explicit and kind of write them down here and have you think about them. So if you were going to collect data from students in your classroom, what would you collect? You could, co you could collect student journals, for example, and they're usually regular dated accounts, like maybe every once every week you have them turn in something, right? Um, maybe it's not graded. Maybe it's just free writing to get their opinions on something. You could have your own teacher log where you have notes and what you did. Almost every action research class, I mean, every action research project should have a teacher's log because you wanna keep a record of what you did and when and why. Um, and then you could collect different documents like um, your lesson plans, for example, that, that, that would be a good document to have to show what you did, right? It could also be maybe um, something from the textbook or a task that you did. Um, you would have, um, you would do an observation, and this could be what we call participant, participant ob observer, because you're the teacher, but you're also observing. So you have to think, how am I going to take notes? Or maybe you could have another teacher come in and take notes for you. There's lots of different ways these could be done. And then that would involve field notes. So field notes are descriptions of events and the setting itself, right? These are all, how would you collect the data? You could have recordings. It could be auto recordings, video recordings. You could have photos, you could have slides. Transcription is the written representation of speech. 
So after you would record something, you often transcribe it. So then you can analyze it. And that's called the transcription. You could do a survey or questionnaires. These typically are not you know, a face-to-face -face encounter. Interviews and discussions are usually a face-to-face. -face. Um, you can do them online as well. And by the way, um, an interview is usually one person interviewing one person. You could also do a focus group where you have one person and maybe five different students. And then you get different answers because they bounce off one another and you get a conversation going, right? Where a questionnaire or a survey is usually a written document. You have to think, hmm, what would get at the data better? Would I trust the answers I got more in a survey or more in an interview? Sometimes you do both. Um, and then you, you could do something called stimulated recall, which simply is where you have, you read the transcription of, you know, this is what you did with the student in the classroom. You could ask the teacher, why did you change the lesson plan here? Or why did you switch to, to Vietnamese instead of English here? Or why did you use English more here? And so that, um, as you're, you could watch the video or you could read the transcript, it brings back um, and it jogs their memory and you could ask them why they did certain things that they did, okay? So tips for busy teachers doing action research, make data collection part of what you would normally do in the classroom, whether it's taking role, lining up, an exit ticket, journal prompts, small group work, parent conferences, qu quizzes, whatever. You wanna double dip, make it do both things and make data analysis just kind of a more intense and rigorous version of what you would normally do to mark and assess your students, right? Then it's not quite so much extra work. Okay, um, I think, let me know when I should stop if um, someone speak up here. I, I'm almost done. Let me see. Um, I'm, is Sorry. it time to stop? I think we should give some time for the, if you could wrap up sooner. Okay. Give time for, time for the, okay, um, right. So let me, let me wrap up another couple minutes. Um, I can always give you this uh, PowerPoint so you have this or it's also in the book so you can see that. But um, this is just an example of a research question and then how you would go about collecting the data. So I don't have time to go over that, but you can look at that later. And then it would be really fun for you to just use this form and ask, what's my research question? What kind of data will respond to it? Um, right? And then how will I collect the data from whom, when, and how, and then what will I do with it? And that's, that's basically how you would, you would, you know, think about your action research project. So I wanted us to be able to jot this down and maybe to share with one another, um, and, and maybe how we could make it a little bit more feasible. Um, so, uh, we don't have time for the tips, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the tips when we do our wrap up. So, um, uh, I'll, I'll go into this a little bit more, but basically keep it focused, right? Um, research something that you enjoy uh, and, and um, maybe because it, it might lead to what you're going to read and do more later and, you know, present it and publish it, right? Start small, maybe just with a newsletter or volunteer in a conference like this one. Um, you're joining a community of practice. You're not just doing a little research or just writing a paper, think of it like that. My third tip is, um, you know, use online resources. There's a lot out there and collaborate with others. I'm on my fourth edited volume and I always collaborate with someone else. I just love to do edited books because it's like a party and I bring all these different people to write different chapters on a topic. And it's just through collaboration, you can learn so much. So collaborate with others and learn from the process. And this is just a whole smattering of, of books on translanguaging that I found so helpful and books on action research that, that I've used uh, throughout the years. So if you want me to share this with you, um, I, can, I can do that. My email is mwong at apu.edu. And I think I better stop now so we have ample time for questions. So there we have it. Okay, thank you for your time.
Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Mary, for a very insightful and practical um, guide about the action research in trans languaging. Yeah, thank you very much again. Um, a lot of tips we can learn from your presentation. Uh, and uh, yeah, now we have uh, 10 minutes uh, for Q&A. Uh, and if you have any questions for our facilitators or presenters today, uh, please send it to the uh, uh, chat box or you can uh, uh, turn on the mic and you um, ask them yeah while we're waiting for questions because sometimes people are shy um, so think about yeah. your question and ask it I'm yeah. going to ask Dong Ping a question <laughs> 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 yeah. um, Ping, if you were to write uh, a question for action research, what would it be? And my other presenters too, what would you do if you could write your, your action research question? Hmm. You think about that. Hmm. So I can ask, uh, how can I design this activity so that my students um, can feel more confident, comfortable, or mm, confident, comfortable, or more um, relaxed in expressing their ideas. Let's have that to start. That's yeah. good. <laughs> right. There's some assumptions uh, in that question, but I love the assumptions in that if we are more confident, if we are more comfortable, if we're more relaxed, we'll we'll enjoy learning more and we'll learn more, right? Right. Mm, so yeah, yeah, that's good. Thank you. Okay. So for me, I think uh, I wouldn't have a one questions, but it is a. Uh, not for teachers, uh, it is uh, more for the boss of the teachers. <laughs> yeah, because um, like in Vietnam, um, before we talk about English only policy, and there's some kind of uh, belief that uh, in the English classrooms, uh, only English is allowed. Uh, but for trans languages, uh, I think uh, we acknowledge that their home language or their mother tongue can be a kind of resource to help the students to learn. Um, and um, our, my question would be like, um, how, how can um, the, the managers supports um, the teachers to translanguaging, um, to translanguage effectively, and they feel comfortable, they feel confident uh, about um, using it as a teaching tool rather than feeling guilty that they are doing something wrong. Yeah, so that is uh, the question that I'm interested in find, finding out the answers, <laughs> Mary. I, I love that. I love that question. And yes, that has the resistance. I received some questions. I received some questions so that I I think that after maybe a few minutes, I got some questions so I, I can say the slides so that the speaker, uh, can you help them to solve the, the questions? Oh, okay, yeah. That's great, thank you. Ma. Yeah, not at all. And so also, I, I, I put the link in the chat. Um, and if you have any questions or you want to have a future references, you may fill in the questionnaire and uh, later, we, if we have any other resources, we can send uh, it to you. Okay, I have the first question. So I total, uh, I totally got three questions in my chat box. So I wouldn't say it on to you or maybe you can uh, maybe make it maybe the answer each questions to each question first yeah one by one <laughs> yes Please. one by one okay <laughs> so that is the first questions that i got from my chat box so and i have made copy to the slide so that it wouldn't be easier for all of us to see the questions so chance language in pedagogy is not code switching and what is the idea percentage of using mother tongue in the lesson? 50, 50% 50 for the primary student is okay. So I, <laughs> I think that maybe that question is from the primary teachers. So anyone can have us to answer the questions. 
Um, okay, uh, so um, when I say uh, here is uh, we do not have a, a formula for that. And when we talk about translanguaging and we have a three stages or three things that we need to consider. Number one is a stand. Uh, does that mean what, what you, what's your belief about translanguaging? And if you're, you think that it is effective uh, and it is a, a kind of teaching tool and it is a possible to use it in the classroom. So it is a, like a, just a stand. And the second thing is about working with the design. And when working with the design, we look at the, the specific classroom activities uh, and some activities you may use uh, the home language or some activities you may use uh, um, the the um, English uh, language, like uh, the second language, um, and the additional language, and there's no formula for like a 50-50 or 100% or like 20-80. Um, and from my observation, some teachers, uh, when they use uh, like a 100%, the primary student, uh, I think that in year three, and 100% of the lesson um, was conducted in English. And it went well because the student uh, could understand her and the student um, could um, communicate. A lesson, it is uh, for like uh, for year one student, uh, teachers in the classroom. And then the teachers, because uh, the student in year one, they did not. Um, understand the rules they did not know how to um, to be engaged in uh, the classroom activities uh, and then the, the the teacher i think that she got uh, what she call busted lesson plan and she use uh, vietnamese a lot uh, so there's no no fixed rules for that uh, and i encourage you um, to 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 set uh, to design and using um, Mary's um, suggestion to think of an accent research project and to explore the formula for yourself and for your students. <laughs> Thank you very much for your um, so interesting and very informative uh, questions and uh, the answer to that questions. And I think that if anyone had that question, so maybe they are very clear about how to use the uh, translanguaging pedagogy. And let's come to the second questions that I got from my chat box. And here is another one. Uh, so, as chance languaging can be spontaneous or planned, should it be applied spontaneously or in advance plan? And in which way is better? Uh, so, again, it can... oh, sure. So, I, I again, uh, I would agree with Nia. There's really no formula which way is better or uh, whether spontaneity is better than planned. I would say, um, the classroom's time is a deciding factor. You have 45 minutes and that goes very fast. So I would encourage you to plan ahead, but allow room for spontaneity uh, mm -hmm. because sometimes students would uh, ask something that really matter to them. Again, connect them to emotional and uh, the feeling of the thinking. If you can more connect to uh, connect students' lives, the more they would feel more natural to language and to trans language, then they, they would be just thinking, oh, English is very easy to learn. I, this is fun, right? Rather than forcing the, uh, all the rules upon them, they have to learn about them. Of course, the learning is, is effortful and effortless. Uh, that should be played out in terms of peak and valley, as I said, rhythmic view, and in a rhythmic way as music. So we always teach, always taught certain way students are, right? Uh, habit, their habit forming can be very helpful at the same time can be very threatening. Once they form a habit, they would reify with that habit. They may no longer to 
want to learn English. Because learning language or learning any other languages is really interesting, open up their eyes, open up their cognitive space, and they can sense their self. They're becoming another person. So we can guide them to that space through translanguaging and design the ways that allow both uh, spontaneous activity and um, with the guidance of the teacher. That would be ideal. <laughs> Again, I won't say which one is better and which one is not. They're both good. It. It's like mm -hmm. saying which, which is better, vanilla ice cream or chocolate. <laughs> but I really, I really appreciated how you said it's the teacher's responsibility to plan and make the most out of every minute. So yes, planning is so important, but it's also really important to allow space for that spontaneity and creativity to happen. So it's both of these things. It's, it's planning it well, using your time well, but making sure you allow time for that also to prevent. I, <clears throat> I really like how you said that, Dongping. Thank you. Yeah. And the plan also gives you a lot of uh, fun things to think about. It's an, it's an action research agenda to use that agenda to further understand what translanguaging means to you in your context. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I remember like uh, Mary mentioned like uh, it should be spontaneous. Uh, but I think that spontaneous is uh, like uh, from the chance language of the student. And as you, um, when you are a teacher, and when you think that as a kind of pedagogy, uh, a pedagogical practice, uh, it should be planned, but also some rooms uh, for spontaneous uh, activity uh, responses, because uh, we, we cannot plan all of the situation in the classroom, what happened in the classroom. Yeah, so be flexible but be prepared. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. I think that uh, maybe uh, the person who got the questions had the right answer, maybe be flexible. And the last question is that I got from my chat box is here. So uh, I see a popular tendency that Vietnamese parents take their children to elite school in Accenture at early age. At the same time, the children are learning Vietnamese. In case my students have good command of English, is chance language in student for me as a teacher? Mm -hmm. So please. Mary, Mary, would you like to go with this one? <laughs> <laughs> Mary. <laughs> yes, please. Okay. Yes, Mary. Right. Um, yeah. I, the first part of just having the children go at an early age. I know that happens. I really hope that they also get immersed in, in their own um, languages and cultures. I don't think that the earlier we teach language, the better. We don't need to rush and teach English to pre-kindergarten students. You know, it'll come. We don't need to push it that fast. That's just my my idea of that first part. Um, and I would I'd love it if your students have a good command of English. That's wonderful. Um, and I would say, yes, even in the most advanced classes, translanguaging, of course, can be used. It can be used in very exciting and unique ways um, with the more uh, advanced levels, as Dongping was sharing, you know, even going out on, on field trips or, or writing. Uh, the ability to maybe start your your poem in one language and then and then seamlessly go into another language. Um, wow, that would be really exciting. So yes, I think it's appropriate at all at all levels, um, not just at the beginning levels where maybe students wouldn't un understand um, English. What about the rest of you? What do you think? What do my other uh, co co presenters feel about that? Um... Uh, for me, I think um, in here, uh, there are two things to look at. Number one is like uh, the appreciation of the home language. Some parents, when they send uh, their students, uh, their, their children to the English center or the international schools, uh, and then everything is, uh, um, um, I mean, delivered in English. And um, the kids, uh, but when the kids come back home and they use English to talk to their parents uh, and uh, they do not use uh, their home language, uh, and of course, uh, it is a thing that we, we, we don't think that we expect that because um, like uh, we encourage uh, uh, translanguaging 
to help the students to enrich their language uh, repertoires, their language resources. That means they can be effective communicators in either language. It is not like a to, 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 to make one language weak or one language um, um, away and leave a room for another language. I want them to be uh, richer in in their like a language a repertoire and resources and they can be flexible in any situation um, so but I mean like uh, when the student can understand uh, English and it is in the English classroom and yeah of course you can use uh, English to help them to to develop that uh, resource better yeah so I think there are two things in here. <laughs> That's from my point, but I do not know like uh, from Hang or from uh, Dongping, what do you think? Uh, I also okay. think that uh, your idea is very great because uh, I think that uh, when... when they are when they in a, be very you know uh, they, they they cannot become deficient in their own mother tongue yeah mm -hmm. so i think that um i totally agree with you dr yeah okay uh yeah i, I agree uh, except i wanted to stress that uh, the case uh, of hong kong i just want to bring that example uh, as a counter example I don't know about the research now, but there was a period of time, uh, uh, the creativity of uh, novelty in creative storytelling, in the um, uh, creative writing going down because of the policy. Uh, so Hong Kong, uh, Cantonese, Chinese, English and there are other languages there too, very, very multilingual society. So when students are not pushed for understanding language as an object, as well as language, uh, understanding language as a communicative tool. So meaning mm -hmm. take a stance with language in English or in other languages, right? Vietnamese or Cantonese that cause a problem for that period of time in Hong Kong mm -hmm. uh, because they take a slip of tongue or some wrong use of form and take it for granted and not be uh, able to use it correctly and not even correct the form. So a, in, in itself as a social linguistic phenomenon, it's very interesting because the, the trend just goes. Once the, the majority use that form, it becomes the correct form. So as a social linguistic phenomenon, it's interesting and with so-called world Englishes. But as the identity development and personal engagement in language, such as creative writing, or other forms of discourse that may, um, may be a problem if we're not careful of, of stressing taking a language stance. So, mm -hmm. so when we allow translanguaging to happen, we really need to be very, very mindful and planned in a way, bring back to students to reflection, to um, try it out themselves, how teach them see if you do a translanguaging, see how people react to your translanguaging. So their, their awareness of their doing translanguaging, uh, the meta awareness, I think um, Nia mentioned it, uh, mm -hmm. I think Mary mentioned it as well. So th that needs to be taught. Otherwise it will be like a period of Hong Kong that people lose their identity and they mm -hmm. don't they have no clue because they grown up that way uh, not ex not not they be able to take a, uh, language extends in particular one language. So we have to treat it dialogically, meaning if you talk to people who only knows one language, you need to be able to make meaning using that one language, right? If you talk to people who are bilingual, then 
and the bilingual um, way of translanguaging is acceptable. I hope that makes sense. So it's yes. not saying not saying yes. translanguaging is the cure for everything. Yes. You know, to take the larger context into situation, we have to know who our audiences are and how we engage them. Yeah. Because yeah. in the end, the students coming to the United States or elsewhere, mm -hmm. right? Large part of the United States are monolingual. And they have to be able to present themselves as a competent speaker mm. and user of that language so that they can achieve success in the academic pursuit. Otherwise, yeah. they will be um, perceived as, oh, that person has accident, that student is shy, and that person cannot think straight. All that biases is based on language, mm. which is, itself is a bias. Is that linguistic language bias, as Harry, um, uh, Harry, Harry Roy, Roy Harris, sorry, Roy Harris would say. Yeah. So I want I want us all be very mindful about translanguaging. It's powerful. It's the, the way the society goes, but we still need to take into consideration of our students' development in their stance. Yeah. Right. Agree, because uh, like um, you need to focus, um, we need to think about audience uh, as well, right? And uh, um, like we learn uh, English so that we can communicate in, um, in either um, situation, English only or bilingual or in other situation as well. And even like uh, use a home language to communicate with the people who cannot speak English or speak a foreign language. Yeah, I, I agree with you. So that is like a, to, to, to enrich our resources, <laughs> language resources, yeah. Yes, thank you so much. I think that uh, all the people here maybe uh, seem to be satisfied with uh, maybe very detailed information and explanation. Mm -hmm. And I think that maybe they know how to balance uh, the use of uh, the language. And I think that I will leave the uh, the set screen to Miss Hai so that uh, she can continue with the presentation, right? Yeah, thank you, Nga. Okay. As Okay, as I promised, uh, our, our presenter today will uh, bring you some gifts to take home. Uh, and uh, um, here are some uh, takeaway message uh, about translanguaging from our presenter. We go first with Mary. The take home message. message. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I wish I really could give you all um, some books on translanguaging and action research, uh, but we do have a free booklet coming, I hope. So um, I think your uh, government is going to provide that for you. Um, so we look forward to that. But here's just my quick tips on collaboration and feasibility. Remember, I just love collaboration. We can learn so much from it. So I would say collaborate with mentors. Collaboration is a really good strategy for researching and publishing and um, just to get started, right? So if you can collaborate, that means you, you are going to learn. Get to know people at conferences, come with ideas for research, for articles, for chapters, for books. Um, I tell my students, okay, first question. Because, okay, I was on the airplane coming home from TESOL and someone looked at me and they said, what's the name of your book? I had never written a book, but I thought, I love that question. And I wrote down 40 different names of books that I was going to write. So um, anyway, I, think about, come to conferences with ideas, find people to collaborate, whether it's a book or a project, look for people with knowledge and skills that you want to benefit from and work with them, but also make it feasible. Make your study feasible. That means doable in terms of how much time do you have? How much experience do you have? How much money or budget do you have? Don't take on too much. Less done well is better than a lot done poorly, remember. Um, and narrow, 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 narrow your focus. Um, don't take on too much. And always provide a buffer because there's never enough time to get things done. So be realistic in your planning. All right, those are my tips. 
Thank you very much. Now it's time for you, Dongping. What do you okay. want to deliver? Okay. So as I mentioned on the slide, I I hope that uh, uh, teachers, one of the job for teachers is to be a gardener, to be a, a, a guide, to be a coach, to provide opportunities for your students to flourish in their friendship by using the cognitive device that I introduced, coordination, right? Give them the opportunity, let them be the owner of their action, um, whether it's elementary or uh, lower secondary or upper secondary schools. They need to be able to uh, flourish as a person. And uh, second point, encourage students to make meaning by asking questions and being playful and allow them to play. Uh, it's a, through play, we can tinker, we can make mistakes, we can learn, from the process of making mistakes. So they can come back to see how can I avoid this mistake so I can go one step further in my playfulness uh, with my classmates or with my sentences. Right? Then uh, I also want uh, teachers to be able to help students. And again, here to help them to tell stories, a story we live by what kind of story they want to live by. This is uh, our ecolinguistic uh, researcher, Aaron Stibbe's book on ecolinguistics, a story we live by. And you encourage your students to be that person they want to be. And that's the driving force for them to explore their multilingual, multicultural, bilingual, bicultural identity so that they can be more of a citizen for their family, Responsibility, responsibility for their community and society. Engage students in critical thinking by taking risks. And I, I see our uh, classroom can be a place uh, students can feel safe. And that's a good thing, but it can be a bad thing. And they feel so safe, they are free to make mistakes, to take a, a step that they're not comfortable with. And that can prevent them from being creative and being learning outside of the box. And increase students' awareness of the purpose of English language. And so most of the times they may feel, I just need to get a good grade so I can move on to college. But it's not just that. Help them to realize learning a different language can open a door, a new window for them to see the world in the different eyes and be able to become a different person, a very cool person, right? And leave space for students to reflect individually and within the group. Um, in an Asian context where I grown up, very Confucian society, our individual tend to diminish. We disappear <laughs> as a person. Dongping, just one of Dongping. Mary, another Mary. <laughs> There's no self per se. It's very nice because we're always thinking in others' terms. But we need to have that self so that we can take a stance and to contribute our expertise, our abilities, our knowledge to the society. And all the above suggestions can be done either in depth in uh, Vietnamese, English, or other um, uh, minority uh, ethnic uh, groups, language, king, mm, Chinese. I, I, I saw that uh, Chinese is another minority language in Vietnam and other languages that I don't recall for now. Okay, so the goal is to help all students to flourish in language because language is our thinking device. It reflects our human as homo sapien. We are very special animal with the language skill. All right, that's it. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dongping. So um, I should be very brief uh, because of, um, uh, um, what I, 
would like to send uh, to you teachers here is like a chance languaging is a teaching tool, not a teaching goal. So the goal is not like to use uh, both languages in the classroom. The goal is like uh, to use that as a teaching tool and uh, use chance languaging to maximize your students' learning outcomes and experiences in your context. Uh, and the students will um, value their um, lang home language, value their foreign language, vo value their second or their third language, uh, and to make them uh, better and efficient communicators. Uh, and that is a goal. And chance languaging is not the goal, but like uh, to make your students uh, become better communicators, that is a goal. And uh, um, by the way, I also would like to inform that uh, like uh, with this project is funded by the US uh, Embassy and also the uh, Ministry of Education and uh, Training and we develop the booklets and the booklets are uh, being edited and after um, this uh, I think uh, maybe their follow up activities or the um, the products uh, like uh, the print booklets or, or uh, other resources on chance language um, that can be sent uh, to teachers in three levels so I really hope that we can get them ready and send that um, those to you and uh, thank you again for the moderators and thank you um, Mary and Dong Pink uh, for all the support and the collaboration. <laughs> uh Thank okay, uh, last but not least, I would like to pass uh, Dr. Kang's message to uh, you all. Um, this is what he very passionate about, and uh, he would like to say that uh, the future success in teaching English as an additional language in Vietnam lies in adopting an approach to teaching that empowers students to view themselves as immersion bilinguals rather than uh, as deficient native speakers. Yeah, uh, that is his message. Uh, and um, well, uh, no, thank you very much. And uh, it uh, has been more than two hours now and it's time to say goodbye and conclude the event. And we uh, would like to say a big thank you to uh, uh, the participants here. And we also uh, would like to thank um, uh, Ian, uh, Moit and Relo Hanot for the funding to the Translanguaging project and this chance to conduct uh, the workshop in uh, Vietiso. Um, and uh, uh, now uh, I think that we should open the e video and uh, uh, thank our facilitators today, uh, Mary, Dong Ping, Dr. Nya, and also two moderators, Ms. Nga and Ms. Nguyen. Okay. Uh, should we take a photo? <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 So that's a great <laughs> idea. I think that's maybe you can uh, maybe put the raised hand or the heart or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. The yeah. can take a photo. Uh, the hand. Hand. <laughs> <laughs> you can do a, yeah, you can do a, a real shape of heart uh, by your hands yeah. on you can uh, like this one. Yeah. <laughs> No, it just all comes up, up right? <laughs> yeah. What about our oh, audience? Okay, oh, yeah, yeah. Help with yeah. the screen, Mary. <laughs> our participants, please turn on your camera. Participants, yeah. so can you turn on the camera so that all of us can take a photo together? Yeah. Yes. Oh, this is another. This point. is a small heart. Oh, Don't think. Yes, small heart, <laughs> right? Small heart from all of us. And thank you so much for your participation today. I'll take uh, this heart sign. Uh, yes, the heart shape, right? Oh yeah. Can you do it like this? Yes, yeah. I, I I can uh, take the photos continuously so that <laughs> everyone can get in the photos. All right, thank you. Yeah. Great to see some faces. Mm -hmm. that, that's it. We want to see you all presenting on your action research project on translanguaging next year. <laughs> yes, sure. Yes. Mary Wong. Thank you, everyone.
Okay. Thank you, everyone, for participating with us in this pre convention workshop. Uh, thank you very much, and we wish you have a wonderful time in Viet Tiso. Oh, we have page two. We have many people. Yes. <laughs> Miss um, Dumping, we have more than 100 uh, attendees on the live stream, and right. uh, that is on the Zoom, so different numbers. So it means that maybe totally 200 people. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. 200 attendees. Yes. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank, thank you, you all. Goodbye. goodbye, and wish you health and bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.